This is the first in a short series of screencasts on how to get a .NET Core application running in AWS on EC2, how to set up a connection to RDS, and how to set up a load balancer. Uh, this is only specific to .NET Core in that the sample we're using is .NET Core. Everything else is generally usable. And so whether it's Python or Java or whatever, It'll be slightly different for you just because you're running something other than .NET Core. But everything, so everything else is really just AWS specific. The sample app, which is available and public for anybody to download, is here on North Dallas Developers on GitHub. And this is the lab. I'm going to start by cloning this. All right, here we are. Here's our app. I'm going to open this up in a text editor. Pretty much everything we're going to do is going to be found in the readme. So we're going to use this as our script as we go through. And this first video will take us through roughly about half of it, I think. Right here, line 104. So let's get started. I've gotten the code, step one. Step two, let's do a code review. We've seen the readme. There's an app settings JSON file. Um, if you're new to .NET, this is just a configuration file. And so we're gonna be using the server identifier A, changing it to B for one server later whenever we set up load balancing. Uh, we're gonna put our connection string there later. Now let's go look at controllers. Here, um, it's a really simple site. It's really just meant to, to test things. So here in controllers, it's it's got a home page, which you'll see in a minute when we run it. Here's a page that, or an action for building a page that will connect to RDS. And then there's a health controller, and this just returns a content string. Most importantly, it returns a HTTP 200 status code. And so this will be used by the the load balancer whenever we set that up in a few videos. All right, so that's that's really just about it in terms of the code. Now let's go to AWS. There's a number of things we're going to do there. I'm doing these things in the London region, but you can do it just about anywhere. Uh, we're going to be setting up EC2 instances and RDS boxes. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and uh, set up the RDS server, even though we're not even going to use it in this particular video. I'm setting up now because I'm going to be using it uh, in just a minute to make the second video. And so I'm just going to get it started. Uh, these things take a while. And so getting it started before you actually use it is a good idea. So I went to RDS and create a new server. Standard create SQL Server. SQL Server Express Edition is fine. Free tier is all fine. We can name it anything we want. I'll just call it some test DB. Set a password, be sure to write that down. You'll need it later. You can reset it, it's not all that hard, but it will slow you down. And so uh, that's really all we need to do until we get to connectivity. And we wanna make this publicly accessible because uh, by default, you can't get to it from outside, which means if you're using Azure Data Studio or SQL Management Studio, you can't connect directly to it. And so by setting this public accessibility, uh, that allows us to do that. It's great for development and testing things. All right, so we have our sum test DB. It's in the state of creating, and that's going to take a while. So let's go back to the script. And so I picked a different database name from this, but pretty much all, everything else should be there. Okay, um, let's run the app to make sure everything's good. So, dot net run. There we go. 
here it is. And there's that letter we were talking about earlier on the server identifier. So this is what we're going to put up on EC2. All right, so that works. The next step is we're going to package up this application. So we don't have to install the .NET Framework on the server. We're going to publish it as a self-contained app. And so this will package the .NET Framework with it. So this command will do that. And this prepares it for Linux x64. Um, we're going to be setting up a Ubuntu server in a minute to run this on. And this is in release mode. And everything got put in these directories. So bin release netcore app 3.1 Linux 64 publish. That's what we're going to want to move to the server. Now to move it, it's going to be convenient to zip it up in some way. We're going to use tar. So this command here will zip up, will essentially uh, you know, cd into this directory, zip up all the contents and put it in a file named appfiles.tar.dz. So let's do that. This doesn't take very long. Alrighty. So now let's talk a little bit about AWS. I've got some pictures to show. What we're going to be building is over on the right. We're going to start with this, a VPC, a subnet, and a web server. So the incoming request essentially will go into the VPC, into the subnet, hit the web server, and that's where our site's going to be running. So what is a VPC and a subnet? Well, a VPC is a virtual private cloud. Think of it as a network in AWS that is custom for you. You can set up subnetworks within that. That's what subnets are. And so you can have public subnets, you can have private subnets, you can have multiple of each of those and just lets you organize things how you want to. So a VPC is like a big container and subnets are subcontainers within them. And EC2 is basically the service uh, for in AWS for creating a server for yourself. Um, if you want to just say, hey, I need a Linux box to do stuff on, EC2 is a good choice. Well, I need a, I need a Windows box just to do stuff on, EC2 is a good choice. And so that's what these three functions are. The VPC and subnet are basically networking pieces. And then EC2 will be what we'll be using to create our server. So that's the basics, and we'll see that as we go along, and it's good to be familiar with those terms. All right, so we're going to go open up VPC in the console. So I have VPC pinned up here, and you can pin things by hitting this little pin. It's very handy. When you, whenever you come into a region in AWS, by default, you're going to get a default VPC and subnets. And so I have this one default VPC here. It's available. Its VPC ID is such and such. And then in terms of uh, subnets, I've got three. And by default, it's going to create one per availability zone. The availability zone is over here, EU, West, 2, A, B, and C. Think of an availability zone as a separate data center. And so it's like whenever you host something in a in an AWS region, um, what they do is they give you multiple data centers to put things in. And so you can put one subnet, for example, in one data center and another subnet in another data center. And so if one of those data centers goes down, then the other one will still be there and your load balancer will still be okay and will send all your traffic to the one that's still running. That's that's the basic idea. These availability zones are, are, are individual units that should hopefully keep running even if one of them goes down. So that's VPC's uh, subnets and this is what we have by default. The next thing we want to do is actually create our e EC2 instance. We're going to search for Ubuntu. We're going to use an 18.04 instance and then we're going to download a, a PIM file and we're going to rename it to something else. All right. So let's do that. EC2, running instances, 
Here's an old one. Don't need that. We're going to launch a new instance. So if you pick the, the blue, big blue button for launching a new instance, you come to this screen, and then we do a search. We're going to take this top one, the Ubuntu server, 18.04. It is free tier eligible. So this will cost you nothing, or at least little, whenever, whenever you use it. And by little, I mean little compared to other options. EC2 can be expensive, depending on what you do. At the end of this, it's probably good if you just shut your stuff off, uh, unless you're really planning on continuing to mess with things. That way you can you know, keep your keep your cost under control. All right, so we're going to launch it. Uh, if you've already got an SSH key with AWS, then just use that if you want to. As you can see, I created a SSH key pair yesterday. Um, I'm going to create a new one today. So let's see, create a new key pair. I'm going to call this my Feb9 key pair. And I'm going to download it. And so now I'm going to go get that out of my downloads folder. And I'm going to go put that in the same directory as my code. Back in a sec. Okay, I've copied that over. Let's go ahead and launch this. It's going to take a little bit for it to get up and going. Not too long, maybe two or three minutes. In the meantime, you can go here and I can see that I have my Feb 9 key pair. And while I'm waiting for this instance, because we look at it, it's in a pending state. While I'm waiting for this instance, I'm going to go through here and I'm going to do a search for NDDG key pair. And I'm going to replace that with this. Oops. Go. So this way when I do these commands, they'll be ready for me later and I don't have to mess with the name of the file. All right, at this point the server is running and while it's in this initializing state, let's take a look at some things. And so if, if you choose the server over here on the left, you can jump in and see some interesting things. Uh, first of all, we're going to need this public DNS. And so this is what we're going to connect to the server with in just a moment. Uh, another thing we're going to want to pay close attention to is this Launch, wiz Launch Wizard 2. Launch Wizard 2 is a security group that's attached to this server and it, it controls what can go out and what can come in to the server. We view the inbound rules. We see port 22 open and this is open for SSH. We're going to be sending some HTTP traffic to it so, so we're gonna open that up in just a minute to something else uh, let's go ahead and jump in there so here we are this is the security group uh, if you hover over here you can see this little pencil and you can name things um, I think I have in the script to name it something else later or name it later let's just go and do it while we're here and so this is going to be my web server security group So now as I'm glancing through, I can say, oh, what is this? Well, it's the web server security group. All right, well, let's go see if our server is available. Close. Well, let's get ready for it, because it'll be ready any second now. So if we go look at our script, the next thing we're going to do is we are going to test connection connecting to the box. Uh, that's going to mean um, chmodding our key pair. And so I can see that I need to rename that. So that's Feb 9 key pair. And then we're going to SSH into the box. And so I'm going to put my server name here at the end. Uh, don't get rid of the Ubuntu app at the, very, at the beginning. That's very important. That's the user. And so if you get rid of that, you actually won't be able to get in. And we're also going to use this here in a second. We're going to use this app files.tar.gz. We're going to use SCP to transfer that. So let's get the server name in there. And I bet the server at this point is ready. 
there it is it's now running so let's let's test that theory I'm going to SSH in oh wait can't do that yet first I have to do this all right now I can SSH in All right, I'm here. There's nothing here, but that's okay because we're about to put something there. To copy my files to the server, I do this. And so I need everything, including that period at the end. And so um, well, I'll explain this in a second. We're going to exit out and now copy. SCP is uh, secure copying. This shouldn't take too long of course, depending on your internet speed. So now what this is done, let me explain the syntax for this. It's SCP, this dash I tells it to use this PIM file that we created. Feel free to open yours up and take a look at it. It's just a text file. So SCP uh, using this file, and we're, we're gonna be actually copying this particular file. And this tells us the location we're copying it to. We're copying it to our server. 94%. Okay, we are good to go. Once we get this done, uh, we need to, to SSH back to the box. Hit up twice, go, and now we should see our file. And there it is. I'm going to create an app directory because that's where I'm going to be putting the code. And I need to untar that. Here's my command for untarring that. That'll all be in the app folder now. I don't need that anymore. And here I am. So now we're gonna run the app and see what happens. We're gonna run it on port 5000 in development mode. Voila. Now to test it, I actually can't go to the browser at this point. Let's let's go test that theory. Just in case you want to see it fail. Here it is. If we go to the server, this is not going to work. And the reason why this is not going to work is not because the app isn't running. It is. And the reason it's not going to work is because we don't have port 5000 open. So let's go test to see for sure if this is even running. So I'm going to create another tab. I'll test this just to just to prove it. SSH in. So now I'm inside the server again, and I'm now going to curl. And there it is. Here's our AWS.net core hands-on lab. So it's there. It works. We just can't get to it. So let's change that. So here's our server, all right, stuck, can't be reached. So if we come back here and go back to this Launch Wizard 2, the security group we were, we named earlier and we were messing around with. If we go, we can see now the inbound and outbound rules. If we go to inbound, we can hit edit. We're gonna create a new rule and say port 5000. And you can use CIDR notation here to configure who can access the server. So you can like limit it to a um, subset of IP ranges. Uh, right now, just for testing, I'm just opening this up wide open just to make it easy. And so I don't have to look at my IP address. So port 5000, now it should be fine. Now we actually should be able to get to it. And there it is. We have our .NET Core app running on EC2 at port 5000. All right, we've got that running. The next thing we'll do in the next video is set up the database. That won't take nearly as long, but we'll go through those steps just to show how it works.